Welcome to Making Modern Treatment Choices in CLL, Oncology Nurse Insights on the Patient Journey and the New Era of Care. Joining me today is Josie Montegard, nurse practitioner from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and Lisa Nodzen, nurse practitioner at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. And I'm Amy Goodrich. I'm a nurse practitioner at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. So before we move on, let's hear from our patient, Bruce Wright, who is going to share some of his journey and his work with the CLL Society. Hi, I'm Bruce Wright and I have CLL. I'm here today to talk to you about my journey on the CLL world. I grew up in upstate New York from apple orchards and dairy farms and was fortunate enough to get into one of our service academies. And after I was commissioned, I went off to Vietnam not once, but three times. During those three visits, I encountered a chemical known as Agent Orange. Decades later, the effects of that became abundantly clear to me. In 2009, I went into the VA and signed into the system. And one of the system parts was the Agent Orange registry. At that registration, I went out to the outer room and met three nurses who conducted a touchy-feely exam, a verbal interview, and sent me immediately upstairs for a blood draw and an x-ray. The results of that came to me with a phone call from the VA that said, come on in, we need to talk to you. It was a nice day, so I rode my Harley. And when I met the doctor out on the ward, he had a nurse with him who understood what my angst was because I laid down, the doctor did a touchy-feely on me and started talking. And he said, you have CLL. And I said, what's CLL? He said, Google it. I had a nurse that was the head nurse. I had the nurse that was the assistant. I had the nurse that was checking on the plumbing and the tubing. I had the nurse that gave me snacks. I had the nurse that said, it's hard sitting in that chair. You'd like to get up? And I said, yeah. And she understood. They had complete sympathy about what I was going through and the patience and the guile and the wherewithal to get me through it. Your meeting with a doctor is a dialogue, not a monologue. Ask them what your numbers are. It comes from the fish test. My numbers are, I'm 13Q deleted. I'm CD38 negative, I'm um, mutated, and I'm ZAP70 negative. The doctors owe you that. Now, I had a good doctor that owed that to me, but it was the nurses that told me what it was about. They taught me what each one meant. My ZAP70 is one of the lowest ones in the United States, which is good. It's good to be low. It's good to be a mutant. But beyond the title of CLL, each one of us is different at the next level down of how it individually affects us. And so the drug that works successfully with one person might not work with the other person or might have additional side effects with the other person that the first person doesn't experience. So the benefit of the renaissance of this medicine era is that there are other medicines available. We're most fortunate in 2021 to have BTK inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors, and monoclonal antibodies available for us to set up our own unique protocol to take care of our individual CLL. If you are diagnosed with CLL and you're in shock and awe, which all of us are, then when you get a chance, go online to the clsociety.org. We're a friendly place. We're not there to do anything but support each other. And we will welcome you, and we will help you, and we will teach you. <laughs> 
and we are constantly updating our database. It's the greatest resource of information. Don't go to Dr. Google. You'd be dead now. Come and talk to us. We will help you. We've been there. We've done that. And we want to pass that on to you. You will have a better life because of it. Well, thanks to Bruce for that great, great summary and sharing his story with us. So where we stand today with CLL in 2021, there are about 21,000 patients diagnosed with CLL estimated for 2021 with about 4,300 deaths. So as you all know, and those of you certainly who work with CLL patients, the median age of diagnosis is 70 years. So this is an older group of folks uh, in general. So then CLL and SLL to our pathologists are identical um, diagnoses. CLL is when there is a presence of 5,000 clonal lymphocytes in the peripheral blood. And then small lymphocytic lymphoma or SLL is the diagnosis when the disease is mainly in the lymph nodes, spleen, and without that high lymphocyte count in the peripheral blood. And then thanks to many of the therapies that we will be discussing um, here in this presentation, the five-year relative survival rate for adults is 86%. So in looking at our patients with CLL, we do a lot of ob observation, um, watching and waiting, and uh, there are criteria for um, treatment for CLL. And these criteria are progressive marrow failure, bulky disease, either adenopathy or splenomegaly, um, progressive lymphocytosis, um, as well as autoimmune complications, uh, particularly autoimmune hemolytic anemia, as well as autoimmune thrombocytopenia. Certainly if there's symptomatic extranodal involvement or if patients have those disease-related symptoms, fevers, night sweats, weight loss, and sometimes profound fatigue as well. So we've got a lot of new therapies available to our patients with CLL. We have BTK inhibitors. Those include abrutinib and acalabrutinib, uh, both of which are FDA approved. Xanabrutinib is in phase three testing. Our PI3 kinase inhibitors are idelalisib and duvalisib. Those are FDA approved. Umbralisib is in phase three testing. Our BCL2 inhibitor is venetoclax, which is FDA approved, as well as our anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, obinutuzumab and ofatumumab, which are also FDA approved at this time. So lots, lots available, lots coming. So Lisa, do you wanna talk about the patient journey, um, particular to naive, uh, treatment naive CLL? Yeah, thank you, Amy, for that nice introduction, and particularly the introduction of the BTK inhibitors as well as the BCL2 inhibitors that we're going to be talking about here in the next section. So looking at starting the patient journey off and the role that oncology nurses play as key leaders in the care of patients with treatment-naive CLL. So first, we'll introduce a case scenario, that of a patient named Alex who was first diagnosed with CLL at age 71. And as Amy mentioned, the majority of patients with CLL at diagnosis are placed into watchful observation as they don't meet IW CLL criteria for therapy. Well, after three years, Alex presents to the clinic at age 74 with classic B symptoms, anemia, as well as symptomatic abdominal lymphadenopathy. Thus, he's now meeting IW CLL criteria for therapy. Most importantly, before we can discuss treatment options with Alex, we have to know the prognostic indicators of his disease. That is, what is his mutational status? We know that Alex has an unmutated IGHV gene. The importance of the IGHV, IGHV gene is that of a prognostic indicator in CLL. It's such that it's important that it goes into the clippy where the CLPI is associated with a prognostic index for our patients where they can accumulate points going into a scoring system. We can then come out with a score and say to our patients what is gonna be their impact on survival, where unmutated IGHV is an adverse prognostic factor. Typically, um, this adverse prognostic factor in the era of chemoimmunotherapy. 
His ECOG status is pretty good with a performance status of zero to one. And like most of our patients at age 71, they do come into the disease with comorbid conditions and they can accumulate them as they begin to get older. The only comorbid condition that Alex is presenting with is that of hypertension. He has a creatinine clearance of greater than 60 mils per minute. So if we begin to think about what is the nurse's role in counseling Alex on having symptomatic CLL now that he has indications for treatment, what would be some next steps that we would think about in counseling Alex? So Amy, in your clinic, when you have a patient such as this sitting before you, are there certain prompts or certain treatment guide decisions that you would look at when pertaining to Alex, thinking about guiding him and helping him make a treatment decision? Right. And so, Lisa, certainly when you have patients who you are observing and, you know, are in that watch and wait phase, there's lots of lead in time to be talking about treatment options and these prognostic factors that we um, typically know in advance of talking about treatment options. So this this tends to be the most controlled time for educating patients and um, getting patients ready for treatment. So really making sure he understands his prognostic score, what that means, uh, and then also laying out what therapy options are available um, so he can uh, participate in shared decision-making to come up with the best fit for him. Yeah, that's really important. And we're, we do the same thing. We really try to individualize that therapy. And like you said, most of our patients being on watchful observation have had a few years to start thinking about what will happen when treatment comes and what are my treatment options. And a lot of our patients have already sought out some education and the significance of their prognostic markers. How about you, Josie? Thanks, Lisa. I think a major part of the nursing role in this instance is really to uh, review the, the treatment options and, and the criteria for treatment of these patients over multiple visits. Um, you know, fortunately with CLL, it's typically not a surprise when someone needs an, a treatment. Um, and so we do have the time to have multiple visits with them where we review their labs, we let them know that treatment's likely coming in the future, and we're able to continually review treatment options, their fears, their anxieties about starting new treatments, their goals of care, so that when the treatment time comes, they're an active participant participant in their, the treatment decision making, and they are able to choose a treatment that's meaningful uh, for them. Yeah, those are some real important key things that we do with our patients to start to prepare them based on these prognostic factors. So when it comes to explaining these prognostic factors to our patients, these factors are very much inherent or wrapped around the disease itself because everything that we do for this disease relies on these prognostic factors when it comes to treatment making decision. The most important prognostic factors in patients with CLL is whether or not they harbor that deletion 17P or they have a TP53 mutation as well as that IGHV status because those two prognostic factors alone are the key ones that really will drive us in decision making. The CLL Society has very nicely laid out for patients the important prognostic factors and what they mean to assist them with their education. So when patients go to that website, they can look up what needs to be performed before treatment happens with the patient. It diagnoses all patients will receive IGHV status, meaning that doesn't change over the course of disease. What's most important for patients to receive prior to the next line of therapy is a repeat FISH test. Because over time, patients, as the process of clonal evolution be ensues, can accumulate new cytogenetic abnormalities. So patients at diagnosis may not harbor deletion 17P, but over time, they could accumulate such a mutation, or even in the relapse setting, they can have that particular mutation as well. So a repeat FISH test must be performed prior to the next line of therapy to help guide that treatment decision. And as we just mentioned earlier, for our patients that are unmutated, there's no meaningful benefit to giving them chemoimmunotherapy as we're going to see um, that prognostic factor right there 
is correlated with a shorter progression-free survival when looking at um, the data comparing them um, to receiving an oral targeted therapy. The NCCN guidelines for treatment-naive CLL are laid out very nicely. As Amy and Josie and I had discussed earlier, when we talk about treatment options with our patients, as also shown here in the guidelines for that shared decision-making, we do take into consideration with our patients their performance status and comorbid conditions that help guide therapies. So when we look at the patient characteristics for frail patients that have significant comorbidities, meaning they're not able to tolerate traditional chemoimmunotherapy regimens that they otherwise would be eligible for based on their prognostic factors, or for our patients that are aged 65 years and older, or even younger than that, but have significant comorbid conditions, you can see the preferred regimens all include one of the oral targeted therapies to be given in combination with or without an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. As, as Amy mentioned earlier, the two BTK inhibitors, Acala, Brutinib, and Ibrutinib are approved on the market for our patients with CLL in the frontline setting, and the BCL2 inhibitor, Venetoclex, as well is also approved to be given in combination with the Benetuzumab. These are all Category 1 recommendations. If we look at patients across three of the Phase three trials that had received Ibrutinib, one of the BTK inhibitors on the market, in the treatment-naive CLL patient population, and we look at the population that entered into these three trials, that of the Resonate 2, the Alliance, as well as the ECOG trial, the patient populations that entered into these trials are roughly what we see in clinical practice, and that's really important um, because when we're offering therapy to our patients, and particularly one of the BTK inhibitors, where treatment with one of those inhibitors is indefinite, meaning we um, don't treat for a finite period, but we treat indefinitely uh, with these drugs, we really want to make sure that we're not causing more harm to our patients, that we're due giving them good quality of life. And so the patient populations that went into these trials are what we see in clinical practice now, um, as you can see there. And then if we look at the treatment arm shown over there on the right where Brutinib was matched up against standard of care, whether it be chlorambicil or standard of care with bendamustine and rituximab or fludarabine, cytoxin and rituximab, these traditional chemoimmunotherapy regimens, key take-home point across all of these three trials was that there was a superior progression-free survival for these abrutinib-based regimens um, in these particular populations. So again, going back to what we just pointed out in the NCCN guidelines, is more meaningful responses for our patients, as well as an improved overall survival was shown in the two trials, the Resonate 2 as well as the ECOG trial. If we then turn our attention to the newest comer to the market, a calorabrutinib, which is also another BTK inhibitor, looking at the data from the phase three Elevate trial, again, treatment-naive CLL patients, you can see the population there is shown as, again, what we typically see in clinical practice as well. And when we look at a calorabrutinib, whether it's given in combination with obinutuzumab or as a monotherapy, again, standard of care with obinutuzumab and chlorambicil, we again see an improved progression-free survival with the acalabrutinib-based regimen. What kind of stands to be shown, however, is whether the addition of abinutuzumab would improve response as well as the depth of the response in our patients. So again, acalabrutinib can be given as a monotherapy in the treatment-naive setting. So looking at the long-term efficacy of abrutinib in our treatment-naive CLL patients, we can see here the final results of the pivotal phase 1b2 trial, looking at the seven-year progression-free survival in the treatment-naive group of 83%, as published here by Dr. Bird and colleagues. So again, just highlighting that a brutinib given earlier or an upfront setting, these patients do very well with a progression-free survival again um, with the seven-year update of 83%. How about looking at the other subgroups? As we mentioned earlier, patients that are unmutated for the immunoglobulin heavy chain or patients harboring deletion 17P or a TP53 mutation have a much more adverse prognosis. So looking at the efficacy of abrutinib in this patient population in the phase three alliance trial, we can see that those patients that received an abrutinib-based regimen, whether it be abrutinib monotherapy or abrutinib in combination with rituximab, these patients did not, uh, where it's not been published as of yet, the median progression-free survival 
whereas giving those patients chemoimmunotherapy with standard of care, bendamustine and rituximab, was of no meaningful benefit, meaning these patients had a very inferior progression-free survival, um, as shown here, based on this data. So again, just going back to, uh, we want to give our patients a very meaningful therapy when we go to treat them, and again, highlighting the importance of understanding what the implications of what the prognostic factors mean, and our role in educating the patients on the importance of that. Well, how about the long-term efficacy of a calorbrutinib in the treatment-naive CLL patient population? Shown here is that for the median event-free survival in the phase 2 ACE trial. After median follow-up of 53 months, the event-free survival had not been achieved as of yet. So again, just like we had shown with the other BTK inhibitor, ibrutinib, these patients fare very well when receiving upfront a BTK inhibitor in the frontline setting. Also looking at subgroup analysis in the Acala abrutinib versus the standard of care obinutuzumab chlorambicil looking at the forest plots. If we do a subgroup analysis, again, teasing out those patients harboring those adverse prognostic factors such as deletion 17P or a TP53 mutation or their IGHV mutation status, we again see that those patients receiving an Acala abrutinib-based regimen fared much better uh, than those patients receiving standard of care, such as with obinutuzumab and chlorambicil. So again, um, irrespective of the prognostic markers these patients carry, we're seeing that these BTK inhibitors are able to overcome these adverse prognostic markers. Venetoclax is also another inhibitor on the market. It's a BCL2 inhibitor that functions a bit differently than BTK inhibitors in that Venetoclax being a BCL2 inhibitor is able to restore cell death. Uh, BCL2 is something that is overexpressed in CLL cells, and so CLL cells are heavily dependent upon it for their survival. And by introducing Venetoclax, Venetoclax can restore the process of cell death or apoptosis. Shown here, um, based on the data of the Phase 3 CLL14 trial, Patients with treatment-naive CLL were randomized to either receive venetoclax in combination with obinutuzumab, again, versus standard of care with obinutuzumab and chlorambicil. Again, patient population is that what we typically see in our clinical practice. You can see a SIR score here greater than 6. Venetoclax is given in a fixed duration fashion. On the CLL14 trial, therapy went for a period of 12 cycles or 12 months, and then all patients had come off of therapy. And with the particular data shown, um, there was an improved progression-free survival at to the two-year landmark after patients were taken off of trial. So an improved progression-free survival at 24 months. So again, remembering that patients were taken off at 12 months. So this offers the benefit to our patients of a fixed treatment duration as compared to the BTK inhibitors where treatment is, um, uh, um, is indefinite. So thinking about discussing our next steps with Alex, um, what sorts of therapy options would we want to discuss with them based upon those prognostic factors? So um, Lisa, uh, as you outlined, we're go absolutely going to be talking to him about our novel therapies, our BTK inhibitors, and our fixed duration venetoclax with obinutuzumab. Um, because he's got unmutated IGHV status, chemotherapy is not not very attractive. We know that, you know, technically we could give him bendamustine and rituximab or other chemotherapy-based regimens, but the likelihood of a prolonged remission or a very deep remission are, are quite low. So we would be talking about these newer therapies and really talking about um, an oral therapy only or combining it. Um, and, and so really just going through the pros and the cons and the side effect profiles with Alex and helping him come to um, a, a decision. And, you know, these are good problems to have that we have, we have options and they're all good. And so um, it, it does sometimes make it a little confusing for patients. But again, like Josie was saying, we've got lots of time to get these folks ready, which is, which is very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. That unmutated IGHV gene right off the bat automatically he's we're going to offer him one of the oral targeted therapies and it's nice to write have choices nowadays where we can discuss with our patients you know we can do these inhibitors or we can do those inhibitors and really tailor to the patient's needs and think about comorbid conditions and 
most patients do appreciate that shared decision making, um, that shared decision making model. How about you, Josie? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, you know, and I think it's great to have all these options, not only so the patient can decide, you know, what they want to do in terms of time limited therapy versus indefinite therapy, but also what fits into their schedule. You know, if someone just started a new job, you know, some of the time limited therapies, venetoclax plus obinutuzumab has a heavy visit schedule up front. So that may be pretty detrimental and and difficult for them to um, accommodate. So an oral uh, BTK inhibitor that's indefinite with less uh, heavy visit schedule would be appealing to them. Vice versa, as I think we all see, the younger patients tend to like the the time-limited therapy to give them the option to be off treatment because once they start treatment, you know, if they're starting treatment in their 40s or early 50s, they got a long way to go. Um, so it's nice to give them a treatment break there. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice that we have choices for our patients nowadays. And again, we can tailor them to the patients and Um, with everything based on those prognostic markers. What do you guys think about if Alex were slightly younger and instead of being unmutated, had a mutated IGHV gene? Would there be something different you might offer him? Would you still consider FCR? Well, Lisa, I don't belong to an FCR camp. We give very little FCR um, because we've got these newer drugs that are much less toxic and um, are, are very effective for patients. And we do have a study that shows that in our younger folks, abrutinib with rituximab um, is superior to FCR in both, a, in both um, response and progression-free survival and even overall survival at this point. So you alluded to the fact that we are moving away from chemotherapy in these patients, and that, that is just so accurate and so true. And it's a great evolution for our patients. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're also in that same camp where we've moved away. And those of us that remember um, giving fludarabine back in the day, that could be a really tough regimen on patients and very immunosuppressive with lots of infectious complications. And sometimes patients just don't hematologically recover. When we think about care coordination in our CLL patients, we know that it really takes a multidisciplinary approach Um, just to bring a patient with CLL and watchful observation to the point of treating them and getting them throughout the course of therapy. So there's many different roles that nurse professionals play, some key examples being triage nurses. When we give our patients oral oncolytics, we're not treating them anymore in the infusion chair. You know, back in the day when patients were in the infusion chair, they could talk to the nurse about all their side effects and the nurse could go over medications with them and provide more educational opportunities. But now with the oral targeted therapies, patients are taking these medications from home. So when it comes to side effect management, typically their first point of contact is calling the clinic and getting one of the triage nurses on the phone. So the triage nurses are really on the front line uh, with our patients on the oral targeted therapies. The infusion nurses, briefly, um, if one of the patients is getting the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, they may be in the infusion chair. So um, they are still seeing the infusion nurses on occasion, but not so much um, anymore nowadays. Oftentimes, we have to participate in financial counseling with our patients and assist them with being able to locate a financial counselor, perhaps within the institution or reaching out to the pharmaceutical companies themselves um, to assist the patients. Also, we have nurse navigators that can participate with our patients. Sometimes they have to help coordinate these visits with us. Um, If the patient has to be seen in the clinic or in the infusion center, the inpatient versus the outpatient. So the care can be quite complex for our patients. Looking at the arbutinib dosing and administration, it's important to point out that for CLL, the dosing of arbutinib is 420 milligrams, whereas for mantle cell lymphoma, it's 560 milligrams by mouth once daily. For CLL, when giving this in combination with one of the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, such as rituximab or abinutuzumab, It's important that abrutinib be administered on on the same day, but before the monoclonal. It also may help relieve in some of the potential infusion-related reactions as well, too. So that can serve as an important teaching point for your patients. 
administration, as we know, um, with once a day drugs, we want this drug given approximately the same time every day with a full glass of water or with a meal when the patient can remember. So working that out with the patient, perhaps evening dosing may be best if the patient experiences fatigue, um, as long as the patient knows to remember to take the medication. Because these medications come from specialty pharmacies, we have to remember that the specialty pharmacy is often not coordinating care with the patient's local pharmacy that puts the patient in the middle. And these drugs do have drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and particularly with the CYP3A inhibitors. So again, we have to educate our patients that prior to them starting out on any other medication coming from another prescriber, that the patient reach out to the specialty pharmacist or to your office to make sure that there's no drug-to-drug -drug interaction, um, because if not, it's going to go unnoticed if you're using different pharmacies from specialty pharmacy to their local. So again, a lot of education surrounding drug-drug -drug interactions have to occur with these medications. A calorbrutinib, as you, as you notice, is going to differ from ibrutinib in that a calorbrutinib is administered twice a day, 100 milligrams by mouth every 12 hours. So that does differ than the once day dosing that ibrutinib. So we have to educate our patients on that, and particularly if you're transitioning them from ibrutinib to a calorbrutinib for any particular reason. Again, they do take a calorbrutinib with a full glass of water with or without food. If they miss their dose by more than three hours, we do point out, go ahead and skip it, but take your next regular dosing. As I just mentioned with a brutinib, these drug-to-drug -drug interactions are really important. But here with a calor brutinib for our patients that take proton pump inhibitors, which is a large majority of our patients, again, considering the age of our patient population, uh, we need to avoid co-administration as proton pump inhibitors can interfere with the absorption of a calor brutinib. So if we can transition our patients out to an H2 antagonist, that is advisable. Looking at other drug interactions with BTK inhibitors kind of across the board, uh, for the CYP3A inducers, we know that inducers reduce the bioavailability of our drugs, so we have to be paying attention to what can possibly happen um, in this particular setting. So for reducing the bioavailability of our drugs, we have to remember that the drug may not achieve maximal efficacy in our patients. Um, but for a calorbrutinib, no dosing adjustment is recommended. And again, most importantly, this is where our pharmacy friends come into play. Um, one, we need to have an accurate medication list. And then two, um, we can run those lists by our pharmacy friends. For CYP3A inhibitors, uh, we have to be cautious as we could be increasing the toxicities of these BTKs in our patients. So again, um, just knowing what drugs the patients are on, highly highly important. And then as I had just mentioned, uh, proton pump inhibitors in the case of a calorbrutinib, if the patient can be transitioned out to an H2 antagonist, that would be more prudent to do, um, again, because proton pump inhibitors interfere with the absorption of a calorbrutinib. Venetoclex, as you're going to see, is based on a ramp-up scheme over the course of five weeks. The reason for that is to mitigate the tumor lysis syndrome. As I mentioned earlier, uh, venetoclax has a very different mechanism of action than the BTK inhibitors. Venetoclax inhibits BCL2, thus restoring the process of cell death. And in, and in doing so, you can begin to see electrolyte abnormality changes within the couple of hours just after drug administration. So the drug is meant to be given over the course of five weeks as shown here in this ramp up fashion where week one in that packet, there's seven days worth of pills for 20 milligrams, then week two, 50 milligrams, so on and so forth. The first one, two, three, and four weeks come as a starter pack with our patients. It's important for the patients to understand not to punch out any of those pills and put them in any sort of a pill pack, but to leave the pills in their protective sleeve so there's no confusion over what day that they're on, um, just to help coordinate them with their daily dosing. It's also important to recognize that venetoclex in the frontline setting when given with obinutuzumab is started on cycle one, day 22. This is in contrast into the relapsed or refractory setting when venetoclex is given in combination with rituximab, where rituximab will start on week six. So that's in reverse, the venetoclex starts first. So it's really important that we're making sure that we're adhering to the mitigation for tumor lysis syndrome protocol in all of our patients.
It's very nicely laid out in the package insert, how to profile your patient. Again, monitoring for drug-to-drug -drug interactions with venetoclax is also really important, most importantly during that ramp-up phase where we can really increase the risk for tumor lysis syndrome in our patients. For patients that are on moderate CYP3A inhibitors, it's recommended to reduce the dose by 50%. Mostly here, you're going to see the cardiac drugs. You may see also some of the antifungals. Really strong CYP3A inhibitors here reduce the dose by 75%. Usually, it's the antifungals again here. So again, we have to make sure that we understand um, and have a very complete medication list that the patient is on and the patient understands to run any of their medications through the specialty pharmacist. CYP3A inducers, really important that we try to avoid concomitant administration with the patient. If the patients are on any medications that are contraindicated prior to the ramp up, um, we can reach out to that local prescriber and see perhaps if that drug can be transitioned out or at our center, our specialty pharmacist will reach out to that prescriber and offer some potential alternatives um, of that drug that the patient could be on that do not inter interact with the venetoclax. So again, um, drug to drug interactions are really, really important. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for that, that comprehensive overview. Um, uh, I think we've got time to take a few questions here. So, um, Josie, so let's let's have you take this question. What has been your experience in keeping patients on schedule with the ramp up dosing of venetoclax? Does this schedule confuse them? No, we really don't have a problem keeping people on schedule. As Lisa pointed out with the starter packet box uh, that the pills come in, that's really helpful for the patient to have a visual of what the schedule is gonna look like. Sometimes I'll also make them a calendar and we'll get them booked out through the entire ramp up. So it's pretty clear about the clinic requirements. Yep, yeah, that's, that's great. And so Lisa, how has your practice changed with COVID, particularly in the use of antibodies? Um, would you, you, are you using more uh, single agent targeted oral therapies or how are you thinking about antibodies in the age of COVID? Yeah, so so here we really tailored it tailored it down to the patient. So um, right with using those monoclonals, that usually means a really long infusion time in the chair for the patient. And so um, some of our patients have to rely on their loved ones to bring them out to the center and come from a few hours away. So for some patients, it just logistically uh, didn't uh, fit within them. So that the oral targeted therapies made more uh, feasible sense for them. So COVID did change that. For some of our patients, um, so we had to make sure from the from the beginning that um, we uh, we did have an accurate understanding of how the patient felt and how was transportation going to be right. um, with the uh, monoclonals and, and even thinking about our vaccinations. You know, if we give a monoclonal, what are we going to do when the vaccinations were rolling out? Right. Yeah. So that's there's more to come on that about what the efficacy of those COVID vaccines are in folks with those uh, anti-CD20 monoclonals on board. So th thank you both. And so now Josie is going to talk about uh, relapse refractory CLL. So let's go back to our patient, Alex, our 74 year old. So he's been started on a BTK inhibitor therapy and he's been responding well, but like most of our patients is starting to experience some side effects. Uh, so here we have two different scenarios. Um, the first of which involves a brutinib. So if Alex had been started on a brutinib and about two years into therapy starts to experience intermittent grade three atrial fibrillation, how would you guys handle that, that instance? What would be your, your nursing care for the patient? Amy, what would you recommend? Right, so clearly you'd hold the drug and you would, um, you know, you typically manage a, a fib exactly as you would had the person not been on um, ibrutinib. And then the, the question becomes, how well does he respond? Is he hard to control? Um, you could consider restarting the abrutinib. You could also consider moving on to a calabrutinib. Um, you know, abrutinib is a first generation BTK inhibitor, so it's got more off target um, effects than a calabrutinib, which is much more specific to um, BTK and leaves some of those off target um, uh, issues alone. So it has a, a slightly lower risk of AFib. So you've got a couple options depending how he does with his AFib therapy. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And that's what we would do at our institute. The other thing that we always take into consideration as well is um, whether they're going to need anticoagulation now that they're on, uh, now that they have atrial fibrillation, because obviously that increases the risk of bleeding. We know there are bleeding risks associated with the BTK inhibitors. So it's just another factor that then comes into play. Um, so in scenario two, Alex has started on a calibrut nib. And early on in treatment, he's already experiencing grade three gastrointestinal toxicity and some headaches. Um, I, I think these are very common across the board uh, amongst our patients at least. Um, Lisa, do you see that? And what do you typically recommend? Yeah, one of the things that we warn our patients about with our experience is those headaches. Um, we know they tend to be pretty early on and tend to get better with time. And we know that caffeine uh, was a good remedy for the patients when we saw them on trial. And so we recommend to our patients, do you drink coffee in the morning or do you drink tea? Uh, take that morning dose of a calorie with a caffeinated beverage. The evening dose can be a little more difficult depending upon if um, the caffeine interferes with their sleep. But um, again, the, the side effect of the headaches tends to get better in time and then tends to kind of be intermittent. The GI toxicities, it depends um, on the patient. We try to really cover a good bowel regimen with them, supportive care, make sure they're not getting dehydrated and checking those electrolytes. And again, that one might get better with time as well too. And if not, we could consider dosing changes on our patient. I agree. And, you know, we'll typically check them for infection if it goes on for a while as well. Um, and so long as they don't have any signs of an infection, we could try some antidiarrheals and other supportive care. So typically pretty manageable in those instances. And that's exactly what they recommended. And you could do a dose reduction as well. So, you know, when we think about starting someone on a second or third line of therapy, you know, I always want to consider what is the reason that they're starting this next line? You know, are they progressing on their current line? Are they not tolerating it? Um, so, you know, in these instances, say Alex is progressing on a BTK inhibitor. In my mind, you have two different options. Number one, you can switch drug classes entirely, explore venetoclax or even a PI3 kinase inhibitor regimen. The other thought is that if they have a BTK resistance mutation, you could try sequencing them again to venetoclax or another um, drug class or try a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, uh, as these are still effective for those patients. Um, and as you pointed out from the get-go, Lisa, each time between therapies, you're gonna be reading, repeating FISH and cytogenetics, so you'd be able to pick up on whether um, there was a BTK resistance mutation between treatments. So on the flip side, if someone's not progressing on a BTK inhibitor and instead just isn't tolerating um, the BTK inhibitor, for instance, a brutinib, typically a lot of our patients are on that older generation of a BTK inhibitor. Um, I think my first thought would be sequencing them to a calibrutinib or possibly even xanabrutinib, which currently is not FDA approved for CLL, though is uh, listed in the NCCN guidelines under a possible treatment option for patients that are not tolerating a brutinib. So I, I think this is a great recommendation. You get the most bang for your buck uh, from that specific drug class before you move on to the next drug class. So now looking at the NCCN guidelines for relapse refractory CLL, pretty much across the board when we think of relapse refractory options for frail patients, for younger patients, for older patients, uh, with significant comorbidities, all of the recommendations are really based on the novel targeted agents. So um, a calibrutinib is a category one recommendation, and this is based on the phase three ASCEND trial data, which showed that a calibrutinib substantially improves progression-free survival compared with uh, bendamustine rituximab or idelalisib rituximab. In that trial, the median progression-free survival had not been reached for a calibrutinib, 
and that was compared to 16.5 months for the other arms. Um, so again, if it's not yet reached, it means that it's uh, been a pretty long duration, which is excellent for a relapse refractory patients. So another category one recommendation is that for ibrutinib, and this is based on the phase three resonate trial, which looked at ibrutinib compared to ofatumumab, and we saw in the ibrutinib arm that there was superior progression-free survival. The median progression-free survival after six years of follow-up was 44.1 versus 8.1 months, which is excellent. Again, really reiterating that these patients in second line therapy are having really durable responses. And then completely switching gears entirely, we can see a category one recommendation for venetoclax plus rituximab, so the BCL2 inhibitor plus the monoclonal antibody. And this was based on the phase three Murano trial which showed that after five years, venetoclax plus rituximab continues to show an improved progression-free survival compared to bendamustine rituximab. And the median progression-free survival there was 53.6 months versus 17 months. So looking a little bit at the grade three um, or higher adverse events over time with ibrutinib, as we've sort of alluded to through this entire presentation, um, the side effect profiles for the BTK inhibitors are typically pretty heavy up front and then even out as the patient is on the medication for longer. So you can see that there's uh, m increased levels of um, you know, pneumonia, uh, neutropenia. We see the more nagging side effects, diarrhea, fatigue, um, early on in treatment, and then as the patient, what I call gets on cruise control, those tend to level off, um, and they tolerate the medication much better. And so this really illustrates the fact that you need to have very close follow-up with the patients in the beginning, because they haven't really ha seen the benefit of the drug yet, and they're experiencing the toxicities. Um, the exception to some to um, the upfront toxicities versus the later on toxicities is hypertension. We tend to see that occur multiple years into treatment with ibrutinib, so that's something that you're always going to have on your radar. Be monitoring those vital signs. Additionally, atrial fibrillation never that risk never goes away. So always make sure the patients are aware of the symptoms of that so that they can report them to you as soon as they experience it. So looking at nursing tips and tactics for abrutinib safety. So when we're monitoring patients on abrutinib, um, you know, we really are gonna be monitoring for bleeding amongst other side effects. Um, and this starts from the get-go. When we're looking at their medication list, you wanna make sure, are they on any supplements that um, can increase the risk of bleeding, such as vitamin E or fish oil? Um, are they already on an anticoagulant? And if they are, can you talk to that uh, prescriber about stopping it or dose reducing it? These start from the very beginning, and then while they're on therapy, you need to make sure that they're reporting any issues with bleeding. Additionally, I always talk to my patients about monitor or telling us if they're having any invasive procedures um, as we typically will hold ibrutinib before and after an invasive procedure to reduce bleeding complications so this may be holding for a major surgery or even a tooth pull it can be minor stuff that you hold for as well we also want to monitor for fevers and infections patients are more at risk for these while they're on treatment. Uh, so low threshold to start antibiotic therapy. Additionally, they're more at risk for fungal infections. So if someone's spiking fevers and they're not responding to antibiotics, you wanna be checking for atypical fungal infections as well. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, we really always wanna be monitoring for symptoms of arrhythmias and cardiac failure, giving the cardiac toxicities of ibrutinib um, so that we can intervene as quickly as possible and hopefully keep them safely on the medication.
In addition to sort of monitoring the symptoms, we're also going to be assessing them quite frequently in the beginning at the very least, checking their blood counts monthly, sometimes more depending on if they started out with significant cytopenias related to their CLL. And also you're going to want to monitor patients more closely if they have risk factors um, associated with uh, ibrutinib related side effects. So pre-existing history of atrial fibrillation um, or hypertension, something like that. So when we look at the acalabrutinib um, distribution of adverse events by year, it follows along the similar lines at, of abrutinib in that most of these occur within the first year of treatment. And as the patient stays on the medication longer, we see them as less frequent issues. This is particularly uh, pertinent for headaches, diarrhea, arthralgias, petechiae, um, you know, all of those pr occur pretty heavily within the first year. And then um, as the body gets used to the medication, as the patient gets better at, at managing the um, side effects with supportive care, those tend to be less of an issue. And then when we're looking at nursing tips and tactics for acalabrutinib safety, these look very similar to what we would monitor for with abrutinib. So we'll monitor for bleeding, we'll monitor for symptoms of an infection, as well as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutters. Additionally, we'll be monitoring for secondary primary malignancies. Now this, in my practice, isn't too far changed from monitoring for secondary malignancies in my CLL patients in general, regardless of whether they're on treatment or not. We know CLL puts patients at risk for secondary malignancies, so making sure they're up to date with their routine colonoscopies, their skin exams, their um, PSA checking and mammograms, that's all really important so that we can detect any secondary malignancies should it occur. And then assessing um, the patient is very similar to a brutinib as well. You're gonna wanna monitor the blood counts at least monthly, maybe more frequently in the beginning, and then advising the patients to practice good sun protection given the risk for the secondary skin cancers. So when we look back at Alex's case, what if he had received upfront therapy with a fixed duration venetoclax instead of a BTK inhibitor? Um, you know, if he tolerated that well, um, received tumor lysis prophylaxis, but was experiencing some side effects related to venetoclax, including neutropenia, gastrointestinal toxicities, and upper respiratory infections. Lisa, how would you manage that patient? Yeah, one of the things that we see um, in up to maybe 60% of our patients receiving venetoclax is the neutropenia. And we, we were pretty vigilant of that, and particularly when given in combination with obinutuzumab. So we manage that with growth factor uh, to push our patients through recognizing that the neutropenia will improve over time. So we're pretty vigilant there with our patients. And we're always, as you mentioned too, you know, we're no stranger to infections in our CLL patient population. So we're pretty vigilant as well about counseling our patients on respiratory infection symptoms. The GI events, the nausea and the loose stools tend to not be very significant um, once the patients achieve the maintenance dose. But uh, I think the most important one there is that neutropenia, making sure the patient's coming in often for assessment of the neutrophil count. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, we find that if the patients are experiencing, um, you know, the milder gastrointestinal events, taking the medication with food or switching to nighttime dosing can um, be the simple answer to sort of getting them through that period. Um, Amy, now what if this patient needs another line of therapy? What would you consider? Right. So if this is upfront therapy, certainly, you know, early on in this whole um, 
journey with these oral drugs, we were worried about sequencing. And we've we've been through this with other malignancies that how, how do you sequence your novel therapies? And so um, I think you're going to talk about what happens if you start somebody on venetoclax and move them to a BTK inhibitor. But, you know, the, the data is good and we're not shooting ourselves in the foot um, by starting one versus the other. And I think there's a rare CLL patient in, in our realms that are not going to get both a BTK inhibitor at some point and a, BC, uh, and a BCL2 inhibitor. Um, it's just comforting to know that you can sequence them however it works for that patient and still get good good effects, good good efficacy. Yeah, I completely agree. And that segues perfectly into this next slide looking at post-venetoclax use of BTK inhibitors in CLL. So you can see here that for BTK naive patients, BTK inhibitor therapy results in, in high overall response rates and durable remission after venetoclax based regimens, which is excellent. And as you pointed out, I think a few years ago, we, were, we didn't have this data, so it concerned patients and providers to sequence venetoclax before BTKI, but now we have it, so it's nice to be able to um, sequence as what fits the patient. So I wanted to talk a little bit about tumor lysis with venetoclax and CLL patients. As Lisa mentioned in the um, treatment, treatment naive section of this presentation, um, tumor lysis is something that we monitor for when we start venetoclax-based therapies, and that uh, happens because of the rapid breakdown of CLL cells, which can cause electrolyte abnormalities in the blood. So there are a variety of ways that you can mitigate these electrolyte changes. First and foremost, pre-medicating the patient with an antihyperuricemic can be very helpful. We'll typically continue the patient on these medications through the full ramp up, and then so long as their uric acid level looks good, we'll stop it. Um, additionally, we educate our patients to aggressively hydrate themselves at home. So I usually tell patients to drink two to three liters of fluid daily if possible, um, it, or at least try their best. And when they come for each new dose escalation in clinic, we'll additionally supplement them with IV hydration as well, um, at least for the, each new day of the ramp up. Uh, additionally, we'll tell patients to limit their intake of foods and fluids that contain potassium and phosphorus, as these are common electrolyte abnormalities that can occur with tumor lysis. So, you know, tell the patients to cut out that daily banana and if they're hydrating at home, tell them to not just do Gatorade, you know, switch it up with some actual water or something like that. And so other venetoclax adverse events of interest include myelosuppression. Um, as Lisa said, this is something that, uh, you know, you need to take very seriously because myelosuppression and increased risk of infection can lead to um, lethal infections. So, we are very um, liberal with our growth factor use to help bring up the neutrophil count when that goes down low. We also have low thresholds for antibiotic use. Um, and you know, if the patient has persistent neutropenia um, despite growth factor use, uh, sometimes we will dose reduce their venetoclax as well. Um, for the gastrointestinal events, as I mentioned, typically these are minor um, and can be mitigated by taking venetoclax on a full stomach or switching their dosing into the evening so that they can sleep through some of that post-dose nausea or diarrhea. Um, you know, you're gonna be monitoring for infection very closely. Patients should have a low threshold to call for a fever or new upper respiratory infection symptoms. And then in some instances, we can see the development of autoimmune hemolytic anemia um, when venetoclax is used as a monotherapy. So if your patient's counts have recovered nicely, um, you know, and they don't have a lot of CLL in your, the bone marrow, and all of a sudden they've developed this new significant anemia, you would want to work them up for autoimmune hemolytic anemia and initiate treat for, treatment for that should it occur. 
And then lastly, patients can have some joint pains on venetoclax. This typically is minor and can be managed with supportive care, including heat, ice, uh, acetaminophen use as needed, or, or other pain medications in, in more significant circumstances. Thank you, Josie. So in, in closing, the CLL Society is an excellent resource for, for nurses, for our patients, for their caregivers. Um, the website is there. You can get lots of CLL-specific education and support. Um, there are multiple free resources for patients and caregivers, and these folks tend to be very information-seeking. So this is a really good resource for your patients. Um, the other thing for um, healthcare providers, so we've talked about a lot of um, terms here that all of you may not be familiar with. There is a great overview of, of some of the terminology used here. This is great for us to understand it better, to be able to educate our patients more effectively. Um, the website is there, so please check that out. And you can find this resource um, titled the CLL SLL Patient Education Toolkit for Nurses. Um, again, this is a, a, nice, a nice tool for all of us to be using. And thank you again to our partners, including the CLL Society. So what's coming in CLL? So watch for combinations of BTK inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors with and without antibodies. We talked a little bit about our first and second generation BTK inhibitors. We talked about resistance. There are lots of um, studies going on trying to overcome that. We now have studies uh, putting these agents head to head as well. Um, and then also CAR T therapy is in trials in CLL. So there really is a lot new and a lot more coming. So hang on. <laughs> And we thank you so much for being here with us. And thanks to Lisa and Josie for those wonderful and informative presentations. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peer Review Institute for Medical Education.